screen. Okay, hopefully this is working. Okay. <laughs> All right, so as they said, I'm Paul Larkin. Deputy Commissioner, uh, well, our real Deputy Commissioner is um, the Acting Commissioner over at Department of Conservation and Recreation. And we hope to have her back uh, fairly soon, uh, in which point I may or may not go back to my old job, which is uh, the Assistant Commissioner for our Bureau of Wayside Cleanup. And that's where I get involved in a lot of uh, the soil questions. Uh, and hopefully it doesn't come to the point where kind of movement of soil results in it being a problem that comes to the wayside cleanup side because there we're at the point of cleaning things up and assessing it and kind of fixing things that went bad. And so a lot of the work that we've been doing over the past 10 years, 20 years have been to try to set up processes where it won't go bad. And you don't have to get wayside cleanup involved. I want to keep out of that sort of thing. Uh, and before I was in wayside cleanup in various capacities, I was in our Office of Research and Standards. I came, come from a background in human health and ecological risk assessment. Uh, but that was a long time ago that I was a risk assessor. Uh, and during that time, I was also our, our conservation commission member in my town, Norris, Massachusetts. So I was kind of doing what you're doing, uh, but we didn't have coastline, <laughs> uh, which makes things probably a lot easier, I would imagine. So that's where I'm coming from. So soil, there's a lot of soil being moved around in Massachusetts um, for, for good or for bad. And either people are developing- I can get this out of your face a little bit. Thank you. Perhaps, yeah. Perfect. There we go. I don't have to see it. <laughs> I, I can just move. Um, you know, whether people are digging big holes in the ground, and there's a lot of development going on, uh, and you know, a lot of parking going underground, or a lot of leveling, where there's a lot of excavation going, going on, and people are you know, looking to get rid of, of soil. And the flip side of that, they, people need a lot of soil. Uh, so you see, you know, the, the signs by the side of the road, either free fill, you know, free fill available, come and take it, or, you know, fill wanted. Uh, but that's at the small level. At the large scale, you have soil brokers, you have a, a lot of people involved in the management, finding soil to be reused or getting rid of, finding ways to get rid of soil one way or another. And DEP's interest is to make sure that all of that is done above, above board, uh, People know what they're getting into, know what they're getting when they're, they're looking for soil. And uh, people want to know where the soil is coming from, what's in it, uh, who is overseeing it, and is the soil, if you're receiving soil, is it safe? Is it for whatever you're using it for? Uh, and the problem, of course, is if there's contamination in soil, then it can get into the, the groundwater and contaminate our drinking water, uh, often, you know, or it's not uncommon, you know, you bring in soil and you know, people build houses on it, uh, people build playgrounds on it. So it create it has a potential for creating exposures and if there's uh, hazardous chemicals in it, then, you know, it could be bad for all of us. So there are a lot of good questions that people ask with soil and uh, not a lot of regulation uh, that goes along with it uh, so far. Uh, it's been, uh, kind of improving over the years. But, so when we look at soil quality, uh, when you're looking at clean fill or clean soil, you know, it's, it's the word clean really doesn't tell you that much. <laughs> uh, and I only use it just to say, don't use that word. Uh, because I mean, if you think about it, soil is made up of a lot of material. If you sample soil for, for chemicals, you will find chemicals. Uh, it's, uh, you'll, you'll find uh, metals in it, you'll find organic compounds in it uh, because soil is made up of stuff. Um, so the question really isn't whether it's clean because a lot of people you say clean, they, they, they want absolutely nothing in it. And if that's your standard, if that's requirement that you send it out for testing and it comes up with absolutely nothing, then you're going to be sorely disappointed because 
you know, it's just made up of, of chemicals. If you sample it, you'll find it. So the question becomes, what are the levels and what do they mean? Is it, is it safe? Is it protective? Is it clean enough for a playground or for somebody to build a home? And it, is it clean enough for you to let your kids play out in the backyard? Uh, can I garden in it? Is it good enough for landscaping? Um, you know, it, can it be used in the median strip on a highway where you know, nobody is actually going to be playing in it? Uh, there are concerns for wildlife habitat for some uses. Uh, is it good enough for the, the bugs and the bunnies and the critters? Is it good enough to put it under a parking lot <laughs> as, as a sub base uh, or for reclaiming an abandoned gravel pit uh, or quarry? You know, so, and that's, you know, we worry about that question at DEP, but a whole slew of different issues, you know, not just soil, you know, whatever we're dealing with, is it clean enough for how it's going to be used for the exposures that's, that are going to happen? And that's the, the same question we ask if it's, we're looking at a facility that is seeking an air permit for what's coming out of the stack. Is the air that's coming out, the exhaust coming out, is it clean enough? Uh, will it create risk problems? Uh, Land application of biosolids. I love wastewater treatment plants. I love that part of this this new acting job. Uh, the biosolids that come out of these plants, yeah, you know, it can it contains stuff. It, is it clean enough to be reused, um, or does it have to be disposed of? So it's whatever program at DEP we deal with, we're we're, we're asking that question. And soil is is really you know, falls in the same line. And this is where my background as a, a risk assessor comes in handy because. You know, I'm very comfortable with the question of, is it clean enough, rather than is it, is it just clean, is it safe enough? Uh, over the years, I've <laughs> been using this uh, wheel of soil. This is a variation on that. I'm going to try to stay out of the wayside cleanup world uh, <laughs> in this, because that, that's a whole other you know, several hour presentation and a lot of fun for me. And I, I, I do have a tendency to, to get into that. So this is a bit simplified. Uh, where when you're thinking about soils, I view it as kind of three gradations of soil. There's stuff that everybody would say is clean, and you might you might view that as background. It has really you know what you would expect to find uh, in kind of natural soils. It's it's not non-detect. It's I'm not saying nothing is in it, but uh, there's nothing kind of out of the ordinary that you would even kind of raise an eyebrow and. Oh, most people were raising our brow and ask questions about. Uh, at the other extreme, in the, the, the pink, we have what we call in, in the wayside cleanup world, remediation waste. This, this is the material that you look at it and say, it, the, whatever is in it, you know, metals or organic contaminants, uh, there's enough of it in there that we really need to, to get rid of it in order to reduce the risk to make the site clean. So the, the remedial action is to go excavate it, dig it up, put it in a truck, and do something with it. And you know, there are various things you can do with it. But that's remediation waste. You're, you're cleaning up the site, you're remediating, remediating it. Kind of an extreme version of remediation waste is hazardous waste. That's a separate category, separate program. Um, not, it's, it actually doesn't necessarily pose more of a risk, but it's a different regulatory category. But that would be included in that. If it's hazardous waste, it's remediation waste. And then what's pictured in white here, the, the clean enough soils is, is kind of stuff in between. It might have something in it, uh, but it, uh, it can be used for a lot of things. The question is, is it useful? Is it clean enough for whatever you're going to use it for? And I would put in this category, um, you know, a large amount of what's in this category is what uh, people <coughs> often refer to as kind of urban fill or urban material, if you go out, you know, any of, any of the soil around here, most of the soil around Fairhaven, you know, how long has Fairhaven been settled? Um, how many hundreds of years? Uh, that's hundreds of years of, in the early days, people are uh, burning wood to heat buildings and then taking the ash and throwing it out. Ash contains uh, pHs and metals and things concentrated from wood. Same with coal that was then used. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of that waste material, you know, coming out of the hearth went out into the backyard. Uh, once we had, once we had automobiles and diesel trucks, a lot of what uh, the exhaust that comes out of those, uh, 
you know, it's deposited either dry deposition or wet deposition nearby. So if you sample any of the soil out here, you're going to find uh, more than natural levels of metals, more than natural levels of pHs and some organic compounds. Uh, and we live with that every day. And one way, of, one question to ask is, if you have a pile of soil, <laughs> one way of looking at it is, is it any worse than what's already here? Mm -hmm. uh, because if you're, if you're looking for purity in the soil that's coming in for whatever the use is, uh, then you may be creating a nice clean hole in the middle of uh, less clean, but still acceptable, uh, appropriate material. And yeah, it may not be worth it. It may be worth it, that might be your goal, uh, but you should do it consciously, uh, thinking about what's in it and what's also around. Uh, rather than just do it as reflex. So I would break soil up into these three categories. Uh, and the reason it's split down the middle is, and this is where we're going to bring in the, the wayside cleanup side of the world. Uh, there is a, a bit of a difference if soil is coming from a, a hazardous waste site, a site being cleaned up, a site that's regulated by the department in the wayside cleanup world, versus soil that's being dug up somewhere uh, that's not regulated, that's not already in that system. Uh, and, and that's because we once we have a notifiable condition, we have a site that's in the system, we regulate what goes on there. We have rules about that. But if you're not in the system, uh, if you don't have that trigger, then those rules don't apply. You could have exactly the same soil. Uh, clean soil or uh, clean enough soil coming out of a, a site regulated in a waste site cleanup program because it's a building being constructed in say downtown Boston or downtown New Bedford. And they run across some oil contamination there, which would not be unusual. So they're notified to come into the system. They're managing the soil appropriately. But as part of that, they are also digging up a bunch of other soil because they're putting in a parking garage under, underground and they have to remove soil. The movement of that soil is regulated because it happens to be coming from one of our sites. The parcel next door didn't find that first you know, trigger of oil contamination in the soil, so they never come into our system. They're excavating exactly the same soil. Looks exactly the same, but it's not regulated. We don't have requirements for sampling and tracking that soil. So that's where we have this line split down the middle. The soils can look exactly the same, but where it's coming from might be give it a higher level of scrutiny, uh, which may or may not be important. But it explains <laughs> partly why uh, DEP might not be looking at one pile of soil, but we are at the other. So, so we have this bifurcated circle, uh, and that's why it looks like that. And the, the question is, you know, where does those upper thirds of the soil go? Uh, the remediation waste, uh, we, there are rules, it's coming out of, uh, especially if it's coming out of the 20 minute site, uh, about what can happen to that, where it can go, that's you know, more highly regulated. The question is, where does the, the clean soil and the you know, clean enough soil go and how is that managed? And that's most of the soil that's being moved around. So. The example that uh, I heard we we're interested in is our gravel pits. Uh, so, you know, they, they historically, they dig out a gravel pit, they create a big hole in the ground. And then the question is, okay, now we want to fill that hole back up again. And, and kind of either reuse or uh, restore that area, put it to some other use. You know, it's, it's no longer a gravel pit, it's a, a hole in the ground, it's a scar. Are in the ecosystem, perhaps. And we have a lot of examples of people wanting to fill in gra the, the gravel pit, uh, restore the grade, and you know, put solar panels on it, uh, put a warehouse on it, uh, restore it and create uh, a wildlife habitat, kind of incorporated into nearby uh, conservation areas. So there are a lot of different things one might want to do with, with these holes in the ground. And the same apply for uh, hard rock quarries as well. Uh, you have the, one of the other factors with hard rock quarries is sometimes there's water at the bottom and people throw things into it. People throw themselves into it um, and, and it can be dangerous. Uh, 
So there are a lot of good reasons why one would want to fill a hole in the ground. Uh, it's a little bit weird with, with gravel pits and quarries. You, know, you take the stuff out and then you fill it back in, and then someday who knows, we'll take it back out again. <laughs> uh, but what, the question is, what, what kind of material would be appropriate to go into those, those holes? And, and the answer may be uh, a range of material as well, that depending upon what you're going to do with it, how it's going to be used, and what your concerns are, you could have a range of uh, levels in the soil that go there. If you're going to use it for a, a playground, if you're going to use it for housing, if you're going to attract people there, if you're going to use it for, for wildlife, uh, you may want to have the top layers at the top three feet, you know, be nice, you know, clean, exactly like what's around it. Um, uh, but the stuff that's deeper that nobody's going to come into contact with, uh, you, know, you might have a little bit more flexibility in, in what's there, depending upon uh, a lot of factors like what's the groundwater table there. Uh, you, you wouldn't want stuff that would leach into the, into the groundwater. Uh, but a lot of the material that we're, we're talking about, the kind of urban fillish sort of stuff, the, the metals, the pHs, they tend not to move into the groundwater very often, um, which is why they're still out. <laughs> You're stuck to the soil hundreds of years after uh, they may have gotten there to begin with. Uh, they don't migrate. You know, they don't leach into the groundwater very, very quickly, very easily. So they stick in the soil, which is in some ways might be a bad thing, but they don't go into the groundwater, which is a good thing. So putting them underground you know, uh, might be an appropriate way of dealing with them. Okay, shows. Um, well, that's a web page, uh, <laughs> which you can, and I'll leave the copy of this or send a copy of this. Thank you. So, uh, you'll be able to see it all. Uh, we have a, a number of web pages. Possible with it. No, no, it's it's the it's, the, it's the Zoom. Well, that's the moving things. That's as far as my technical knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is good. This is good enough. At least you see the, the URL. Uh, and if if you Google uh, mass.gov, massdep, soil, then you'll get into this realm of stuff. There are a lot of pages there. Uh, in this page, as you can see in the bottom, uh, there are a lot of different policies and rules and concerns we have for for soil. Uh, there are there are boxes, there are choices there for uh, soil that you might find when you're redeveloping a rail trail. It's one of my favorite policies I, I've worked on. Um, that's really cool and still very useful after all these years. Uh, there, we reuse soil at landfills uh, for daily cover, for, for instance. You know, and, and for that use, you know that soil is going to end up in a landfill. You know there are no kids playing on it while it might be you know, every day once it's put down for daily cover. Uh, and eventually it will be capped and closed and there will be clean material on top. So the soil that we allow for use as daily cover, for example, can be more contaminated than soil we would want people to use for you know, developing a playground. Uh, and it's that sort of thought process that, that we go through. So the, the kind of quarry fillings, uh, gravel pit filling stuff, um, we've been paying a lot of attention to since 2015 or 2014, uh, part of the budget, there was an outside section of the budget, which addressed and gave us some authority to, to regulate uh, soil being used to fill quarries and gravel pits, so uh, that type of thing. And we came out of that process of trying to figure out how to do that, with a, a policy called COM15, which simply means that it was released in 2015, that's 15, and, and it's a commissioner's level policy, which uh, usually indicates that it applies across various programs, that it's not specific to one program. And, and this is something that touches on issues of you know, waste cleanup, it touches on solid waste issues, it touches on um, various reuse issues. So it's a uh, big team out of the commissioner's office rather than one particular program. Uh, and there are a bunch of videos on that, some of which replicates what I'm talking about today. Um, so 
this is this interim policy on the reuse of soil for large reclamation projects. Uh, so we do have some guidance and policies, uh, this policy on if you're going to fill a, a, a gravel pit or a quarry, then uh, this is an optional approach for doing that. It, and it's good to use this to highlight kind of how we look at this and how we address these issues. It was in the FY15 budget. We don't have to read all of that, but it's there. It, it basically tells us to figure things out uh, and gives us some options for doing that, uh, but, but not very specific. Regulations, guidelines, standards, or procedures. Uh, you decide, figure it out, what, whatever works best. Mm -hmm. Want us to look at the suitability of the soil, kind of how clean is clean enough, is it clean, appropriate for that? Um, and they want to make sure, and this is what kind of our overall you know, goal in the department, something we, we think about all the time is whatever we do, we want to make sure that it poses no significant risk to health, safety, public welfare, or the environment. It, it has to be safe, uh, it has to be appropriate. Uh, it tells us look into the transportation, operation, and foreseeable use of these quarries and gravel pits. Um, and whether or not uh, it re would require a permit, it authorizes us to actually set up a permit program. Uh, we haven't done that yet. Uh, we're doing this in a way that doesn't require a formal permit the way that most people think about permits, but uh, it does require an enforceable order. Uh, and it talks about uh, categories and issues that require local approval. And that's, that's an important piece of this. Uh, a lot of soil, uh, soil movement is, is not regulated by DEP. Uh, we have a surprisingly minor role in all of this. And a lot of the uh, approvals of regulation uh, comes from the local sector. Uh, so we did, uh, we focused on uh, guidance and an approval process uh, that stopped short of an actual permit program. Uh, that would allow us to um, focus on the reuse of the soil and, and not disposal of soil. This is not a, a process. We don't want quarries and gravel pits to be used, viewed as a place to dump contaminated soil. Uh, one of the first projects I worked on back when I was a child at DEP uh, was the Sullivan's Ledge Superfund site in New Bedford. And you know, which was basically a big hole in the ground that people dumped a lot of stuff in, in including when I was driving by this morning, I was thinking, oh yeah, you know, you drive, you're driving by and you're passing the airport and there's a little plane that flew over overhead and all looks right, but oh yeah, they used to dump planes that crashed into <laughs> that pit. Yeah, they used them as disposal sites here. It's a big hole in the ground, fill it with something, fill it with trash, even better. And we've spent, been spending a lot of time, a lot of my life has been spent cleaning up after those actions. So we definitely don't want to recreate that here. We want to make sure that as we're filling these holes, we're doing it with material that's, that is not going to pose a risk now or into the future. Uh, I don't want people digging these things up because some future me is telling them to. I. Uh, so part of this, what we had angst about is how do you distinguish between what's reusing soil that might have some levels of material in it versus what is disposal and just doing it for the sake of getting rid of it. Uh, so there are definitions for what we view as reuse and disposal, but suffice to say, we're focusing on reuse of the material. Uh, and in all of us, the uh, DEP and the local inputs are kind of what uh, what, are, what we don't want to create has, new houses with sites, as I just said. Um, uh, it's in our interest that everybody, whenever you're dealing with soil, whether it's in this program or elsewhere, uh, and as conservation commissioners and agents, you know, I would, I would uh, really impress upon you, you know, using your powers and, and your authority whenever possible to, if people are talking about bringing in soil as fill, which you know, might be, you, know, you run across all the time, uh, asking the questions, where are you getting it from? Uh, has it been tested? If so, can we see the results? What do these mean? Uh, it hasn't been tested, why not? Um, people should be- Is testing a requirement um, it, at it, some level or? 
uh, only if you make it a requirement. I mean, there, there are situations where testing is a requirement. If it's coming from a hazardous waste site that we regulate, yes, it is going to, it, well, it should be tested. The rules say it should be tested. Um, but as a uh, working on the Conservation Commission, um, I was on our CONCOM back in the mid 1990s. And I, I left partly because of the story I'm about to tell you, I, I had to quit. Um, because at the same time I was at DEP, uh, I was still in our Office of Research and Standards. I was a risk assessor back then. So I didn't have direct involvement in regulating the big dig and the soil that was being excavated from downtown Boston. Uh, but I had a role in that. So when our town basically clear cut a piece of park uh, with the classic kind of Middlesex Fells-ish uh, exposed bedrock outcroppings and kind of rolling hills and decided to accept big dig, big dig fill and flatten this large area. Um, they thought they were going to create ball fields and, and remember that, oh, it's in the middle of a golf course and the kids couldn't even get there without being pelted by golf balls. <laughs> so now we have, we have this big flat area in this park <laughs> for no apparent reason, because this, the, the dirt just showed up when, you know, over the, well, I was gonna, would, would say one day, it was over the course of several weeks. And where it eventually ended up was the CONCOM had no authority over, but we took several enforcement actions because it didn't stay where they put it initially and went into our, a wetland and isolated, isolated land, subject to flooding, blah, blah, blah. Um, and you know, they presented the city with no sampling data, no information about where it came from other than it came from the big dig. Suddenly so, like, you know, it just showed up. Uh, and if you went out there uh, and looked at it, you would uh, periodically find your know, pipes and debris kind of sticking out of it. Um, and we spent a lot of work at, as the CONCOM uh, requiring the sampling. Uh, the, da the data was there. It just was never presented to the city, requiring them to present it to us uh, and getting it out of the, the protected areas. And it was a big mess. And you know, there was no forethought into it. Uh, no thought about what might actually be in it. Luckily, it did come from the deepest part of the big dig excavation, and you know, I kind of confirmed that uh, in my role at TEP. <laughs> uh, but nobody thought to ask or think about it. Uh, that the, and, and that's something that is in the, the, the power of the conservation commissions. You know, if people are proposing, you know, Phil, it's certainly within uh, your jurisdiction and, and your ability to ask well what's in it and and have it sampled uh, because they're putting it in a, a, a resource area or a near resource area where you know, migration you know, uh, could cause problems. But just because somebody says it's it's clean, you know, trust and verify. I would say. Um, uh, if you don't mind another interruption. Oh, no, um, sure. No, I've, um, I could do this all day. <laughs> we, 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 we're, we're involved with two projects, stormwater projects, one in Wareham, one in the Cushnet. Um, the Wareham project may be, um, both stormwater projects require a lot of fill to be, uh, well, material to be removed mm -hmm. uh, uh, for the, for the uh, infiltration systems. Um, in Wareham, it might be a uh, fill area. In a cushion it, it's not in a Superfund site, but it's relatively close to the Superfund site. I suspect both DPWs will reuse their soils. So what would be the prudent thing to do? I, I, I guess if it's just being handled internally, um, it's just like a town decision. There's no requirement for testing. Uh, what would be the prudent thing in both cases? Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's kind of very on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, the 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 hammer that's kind of floating over everybody is if you if you move contaminated soil from one location to another uh, and, and lay it down, if it's contaminated and inappropriate for that location, then it becomes a release to the environment, potentially regulated by our, has, our basic cleanup rules. And, uh, and at some point in the future, when we find out what's there, it may have to be dug up and, and removed uh, and cleaned up. So, you know, one would one would hope that uh, a town would be thinking about where it 
what's in the material, uh, what's likely to be in it, uh, and sampling and reusing it appropriately. Um, I know many towns it will, I mean, sampling costs money, it takes time. Uh, some, some towns certainly will think that, well, I'm, I'm bringing it from one place and using it in the same way, it's kind of like to like, and that might be, that might be appropriate. Um, I, I personally would think it would be good to know what you're moving around. Um, oh, that, that sampling criteria is, it's one sample per what, 100 cubic yards typically uh, for a, you know, a 21 e site or it's not, a, it's not a lot of sampling that you have to do. Right? Yeah, no, it's not, uh, the, the amount of sampling will depend upon kind of the conceptual site model, what you think is going on, uh, how it, it, it got there. If you're looking at something that you have reason to believe isn't, you know, wasn't, something wasn't spilled on it, something wasn't dumped on it, but it's been exposed, it's been, you know, superficial soil in an urban area where this likely to be lead from leaded gasoline from the 70s. It got deposited there, there are going to be pHs in it, uh, and you want to know Kind of what the levels are because maybe maybe it can be reused or you know, at project near the school but you want to make sure uh, so there you might uh, take a couple sample it, it might not depend uh, it might not be a strict one sample per volume and there are ways of minimizing that by taking composite samples because what we're really concerned about uh, is kind of what the overall risk is I mean most um, particularly for soil that's been out in the, in the environment, it's not going to pose an acute risk where if somebody touches it, something's going to happen. Uh, it really is long-term that if you have a uh, soil in a playground or um, say soil on a ball field, we've seen cases where ball fields have been rehabbed uh, with soil that had uh, say elevated levels of arsenic in it because arsenic can be naturally occurring at really high levels. As if you don't have enough to worry about. <laughs> um, uh, it, you know, there's a difference between soil that somebody might walk across on the way to a store versus soil that your kid's going to be sliding into your home plate mm -hmm. and creating dust and, and creating exposures. Uh, so it, it depends on its use. It depends on our uh, uh, what might be in it, but you can also take, like I said, composite samples, a little bit here, a little bit there, mix it all together, and then you'll get an average, that one analysis will give you it, the average composition for all of that sampling. It's a, a, good, a good, quick, cost-efficient way of saying, you know, this volume of soil, generally, you know, if I are exposed a little bit each day at different points, this is what I'm gonna be exposed to. They say, you know, Marion, they brought the stuff down to cap our landfill with it. Yeah, and so capping landfills would be a different, a different exposure, different levels of concern. Um, and, you know, the, the, the more, the, the larger the soil you'll be dealing with, the bigger the potential concerns are. You know, if it's a, a small hole that DPW is, is digging to get at a leaking pipe, and they put, you know, most of it back and they have a little bit Left over that they have to get rid of. Yeah, you know, that's less of a concern than if you're digging up a, a large amount or you bring in big piles to to rehab a ball field or something. It's you, know, you do want to scale your your response and your concerns to kind of the size of the, of the potential risk. Uh, and the local input is is really necessary because they they you know people see big piles of soil being moved around and it's going to raise you know people's interest. Uh, they're going to have all of those questions that I listed in the front. Um, and, you know, those are legitimate real questions that, that people should be asking. Um, and, you know, we don't want to, DEP, we don't want to approve projects uh, that, you know, does sit well with the local community. Uh, so part of this COM15 policy is at a very explicit stage of going and seeking uh, local input and local approval of, of project. And some towns will have uh, bylaws that require and, and have a, a process set out uh, in a formal approval process, and that will serve the purposes for, for us. 
Uh, if not, we, we require uh, that the proponents meet with the town officials and that we get a letter from some appropriate authority, the, uh, the mayor, the um, or the, the board of selectmen or kind of whatever would be appropriate for the town, uh, kind of saying that it's been reviewed and you know, it has the town's support. Uh, and that you know, any issues that are raised by the public and by the town officials are addressed. Uh, and often it's you know, the easiest things to address are in fact the concentration, the contaminant <laughs> level issues, uh, because it can be fairly clear. We have standards, we have rules about kind of what levels are appropriate for what uses. That's relatively straightforward. Uh, it's the issues, and you're probably familiar with them, truck traffic, <laughs> the noise, the dust, um, you know, the uh, certainly have had cases where people uh, surrounding a quarry have been you know, fighting the quarry operations for years. And you know, they, they're really happy when, okay, the quarry announces that we're, fine, we're, we're, we're done. We're going to no longer be mining you know, this quarry. And everybody cheers. And then the next day, but now we're going to fill it up again. <laughs> and just when the community thought they got rid of all of those trucks, leaving the quarry with the stuff, now they have the equivalent number of trucks coming in and filling the quarter for it. So, you know, the communities have concerns and, and that's why kind of, we're looking at the end uses of these. It, this, the, you know, we want to see the soil reused for some good purpose. And at the end, the, the community will have something, uh, whether it's, it's a new park, uh, a new conservation area, uh, wildlife habitat, or a warehouse that provides jobs or you know, whatever it is, uh, you know, it, it's a goal and the soil is just one piece of getting to that goal. The goal should not be getting rid of the soil. And, and sometimes we see that and, uh, and you end up with some kind of outrageous proposals for, oh, okay, we're gonna create, we're gonna build this mountain. <laughs> here in people's backyards, because uh, landowners in fact can charge quite a bit for, for taking in contaminated soil. So it can, you know, there are situations where it may be viewed more as a, a taking in the soil is the purpose because that will uh, lead to uh, you know, an income stream. Bluntly. So, so what do you do with Which, the soils that's too contaminated to be used? Where do you put it? Well, that's that's the uh, that's the interesting part of, of my new job <laughs> 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 because it is uh, it's not that question's not limited to soil. There are limited things that can happen to contaminated soil. There are treatment options depending upon what the contaminant is. Uh, there are situations where uh, soil has been incinerated. Uh, to get rid of organic materials in it. Uh, that won't work, of course, for metals. There are uh, situations where soil can be treated with, um, basically made into cement, treated with Portland cement, it's solidified, and then you can use those blocks for, uh, for construction. Um, there are situations where the soil will be disposed of uh, in a landfill, instead of uh, perhaps used as daily cover, which kind of helps uh, because you have to use something as daily cover, why not the soil, or putting it in landfill as straight disposal. The problem in Massachusetts and specifically in New England uh, more generally is that we don't have a lot of landfill space left. Landfills are closing, we're not citing landfills. Uh, we would entertain any proposals uh, for a new landfill. Uh, we, we would give them a, a fair evaluation, but we don't have them coming in there. Uh, and it's not DEP's you know, role in life uh, to propose new landfills. Um, uh, we have to wait for people to do that. Uh, so landfills are, are not being created. Uh, a few of them have gotten expansions, but there, there is a finite life to, to landfills. And if you can't dispose of whether it's soil or biosolids, often get disposed of uh, in landfills or are uh, Got residuals from recycling. Uh, you can you know, all of your recycling programs. A certain amount of that, even after when all the good stuff is taken out, this this stuff left over that has to be disposed of. Our trash uh, has to be disposed of. So all of this is competing for valuable space, 
And, and that's part of the problem that we're seeing that uh, if it becomes more expensive to properly dispose of soil, then what happens to it? Uh, you get people, whether it's dumping soil or other material, if it's too expensive to get rid of legally, then it is got rid of illegally and you end up with uh, midnight dumping and you know, big problems that then it's up to the state and local governments to, to deal with. <laughs> and we don't want that. So it's, uh, we, we think it's in everybody's interest uh, to identify and regulate proper disposal of this. You know, our goal would be to, you know, even this, the, my, the you know, clean enough for what soil, the clean enough soil, uh, one option for that stuff is to send it to landfills. But if you do, it's taking up space that would probably better be served by really contaminated soil. If you can reuse it uh, appropriately um, in, a, in, a, in a quarry to help fill the quarry, then that's probably better than putting it into a landfill uh, where uh, we don't have the space and something, something worse really should be going into it. So that's, that's a key piece of all of this. If, if, you, don't, if you don't give uh, good places to put it, legal places to put it, appropriate places, it's going to end up uh, being a problem. Uh, the advice that we give to a lot of people is when, once you have a proposal you know, coming to you or you're in a position where you're proposing to reuse soil, um, coming in to talk to DEP and the regional staff, um, John Handerhand was going to come here. I think he, he thought it was at 10, starting at 10. So uh, he may show up right at the end. Uh, from our Southeast Regional Office is a good person to talk to, but our, you know, talking to the regional director down here, it's Millie Garcia Serrano, uh, is regional director, uh, very familiar with these issues. Uh, she came, uh, her background is kind of like mine. She, had, uh, she was a human health risk assessor to start with and came out of the Wayside Cleanup Program. Uh, so she's, very good at this, very knowledgeable about it. Uh, talking to municipal officials, you, know, you guys, you know, people should be coming and talking to you and, and feel free to come and talk to us when they do uh, about what people are asking and, and working to make sure that you know, these projects are done with the appropriate material and, uh, and where it's appropriate. We're, what we've been asking people to do is enter into an, an administrative consent order with us. Uh, the proponent uh, that is trying to fill a quarry or a gravel pit. And when I say administrative consent order, uh, most people think, oh, something went wrong and yeah, this is an enforcement action. This is actually using it in the ACO uh, not as uh, punishment for something that went wrong, but it's to establish an enforceable agreement between DEP and the parties that are doing the work, that are filling the, the gravel pit. Uh, on what's going to be sampled, uh, how often it's going to be sampled, what levels are acceptable uh, in these ACOs. We put in requirements for uh, third party, like random sampling to happen, they have to pay for. Uh, we require that the reports be submitted electronically and are up online. There's a slide in a second that will show you that. Uh, so that there's a, a, a lot of transparency about what's coming in, what the sampling data will be online, uh, so that anybody's interested can see what exactly is happening in that. So this, the ACOs that we ask people uh, to enter, enter into is stands in for the permit that other programs might have, uh, and it's simply an enforceable agreement that if they violate it, if something bad goes on, uh, we, we can find them, the, the penalties that are, are in the ACOs, they're very explicit, it's very clear, uh, and we can require them to fix whatever went wrong. Um, so the, I say ACO, but think of it as a permit. It's the, the agreement and it's enforceable, which is the key part of it. Um, and they have a soil management plan that describes exactly what they're going to do when they're going to do it um, as well. Yeah, uh, you know, this is, this kind of leads me back to the things that I saw most, uh, you know, in working in municipalities. That the old sort of bottle historic bottle dumps that you see, you know, every town had three or four, and then every farm had one in the back. You know, are there are there actions that uh, you know a municipal official should take when they when they see these things on site or um, you know concerns? How uh, typically, in your experience, how how contaminated are those areas? 
Uh, it first it will vary. There's no, you know, but you know, the typical kind of bottled up I uh, is is usually uh, just solid waste kind of materials. Um, so you'll you'll end up with a lot of metals because you get a lot of you know tin cans and other you know, metal debris being thrown back there. You know, bottles aren't, aren't that bad uh, themselves. I, the, the wild card there is what, what else was thrown out there, either by the person that owned it or, or by uh, people that drove by and did the Arlo Guthrie thing. Oh, there's a big pile of trash at the bottom of this cliff. I have a big pile of trash. Oh, you know, one pile is better than two. Um, so it, it's the the extra thing, and and like down here, um, you know, <laughs> sad to say, you know, if if I were I drove by and saw kind of a dump area that historically been used dumping around here, you know, the first thought that I would have is you know, PCBs, because you know, as of John Handerhead, it right. <laughs> started early. Oh, fair enough. It's all good. <laughs> but as I said, this is a person you can like call. He'll give you his number. Yep. Just any question. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, oh, you really have dug in. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Does that not have 10? I, my email said 10. Uh, nine. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, but, uh, so we're just going through talking about uh, soil in general and you know com 15 projects in particular uh, the, so all of this stuff is online so we, we one of the things we want is your know, transparency in this uh, we too much happens where people uh, say you know, nobody told us about it you know I was scarred by you know, my town bringing in the big dig soil and they didn't tell anybody uh, just the, the mayor and the, the head of the parks department. Uh, so transparency is a big thing. Uh, you can gain a lot of trust. Uh, you know, people are naturally going to be suspicious about where is the soil coming from and what's in it. And you know, if we lay it all out and put it online so anybody can look at it, uh, you know, hopefully that will help uh, build trust and, and have people feel comfortable with what's going on. Uh, so we have a bunch of uh, projects uh, that are online. Um, I'm, I, I think this is an older slide, so it's we have more than nine now, but it's in the uh, you know dozen or so at any given time. Uh, and then they fill. The first one we had was that we used this process on was wasn't actually a a quarry or a gravel pit. We used it for a cemetery mm -hmm. where uh, they wanted the uh, Archdiocese of Massachusetts wanted to expand a cemetery and needed to bring in you know, fill. <laughs> to then bury people in. <laughs> um, but it was a very good use for it. And it was it lasted about two and a half years or so of, of taking dirt and then it was over and they landscaped it and they have a very lovely cemetery. So you know these these projects come and go. It's a you know uh, the bigger the hole to fill obviously the longer it will take. But um, is there a period of time where a quarry has been abandoned long enough that you know you have a, a wetland and a pond at the bottom that, that precludes it from being filled? I, I first, it's been a long time since I was a CONCOM member, so I'm not going to uh, say this is the authoritative answer, but I don't believe that that's a, a would be a resource area. Protected. I, I may be wrong, and it's worth calling making sure, but we uh, certainly have, it has not prevented the filling of uh, dangerous quarries that have water at the bottom. Some of the kind of best known examples of that are quarry hills in you know, Quincy. Uh, there are a couple of quarries there that you know, there have been several deaths, uh, people jumping into it. Uh, and and those were the, those were filled in now make uh, it's like one of the premier rock climbing locations in the state. Um, as part of the, the walls were left uh, exposed, which probably has its own dangers, but, <laughs> but at least you can read. Right, never mind. Uh, so, so all of this is online, so you can you can take a look at it. And that's part of it, and you can you know, literally download uh, 
you know, some very large documents with all of the, the sampling data, uh, if somebody wanted to dig into it. Uh, and you know, most people don't, but some people do. And it's it, and some people find comfort in knowing that it's there if they, they wanted to look into it. Um, so I think this is my last slide. Yeah. Um, and this is, again, just to highlight the, the difference between these COM15 projects where we enter into ACOs with, with the folks and uh, and kind of the level of scrutiny the soil gets from it. Uh, we do not require our projects to come in and get an ACO. We think there are a lot of benefits for it and we have incentives for people to do that. But in general, DEP does not regulate just any filling. People have the ability to bring in fill to their land and to fill a hole. Uh, you know, other laws might apply. Other you know, certainly you can't fill your wetlands, for instance. Uh, this has nothing to do with that. All other laws still apply. But people bring in fill. Uh, when I bought my house, I brought in a couple truckloads of fill to flatten out an area in the back. Uh, the question is, at, at what point, you know, should there be more regulatory scrutiny? And, and the other thing, for the people that are proposing it, there's benefits in entering into these ACOs, because we say, as long as you're, you're abiding by the ACO and you're doing all of the sampling, you know it's coming in, soil is heterogeneous. If, if you know, with water, drinking water is great. You know, if you go out and sample what's coming out of your tap, you take one sample and then you leave it running, and then you take another from the same water coming out of the same tap from the same system. In all likelihood, they're good, they're, those results are going to look the same because it's homogenous. It's all of it mixes together and it's very consistent. Soil is not consistent. You can you know, go out front here and you can take a soil sample here and a soil sample there, and you can get completely different results just depending upon what you pick up. Uh, you know, one, one thing we see a lot is widely varying levels of lead, for instance, because if you take a sample and that sample happens to contain a flake of lead paint that fell off the building and the yellow sample doesn't, this one's gonna be sky high and this one will be normal. So, um, so you know, I'm not sure where I was going with that now. I completely got lost. It's all variable. <laughs> it's, it's all variable. There's a lot of variability in the soil. Oh, I know. So if if they abide by all the rules and they meet all the, the standards and all that, but somebody goes out and takes one sample and happens to hit one bad one, then in theory, it's a notifiable condition. It comes into our recycle cleanup program and they have to do a whole site assessment. So part of what they get out of the ACO, when we enter into an ACO, uh, we're requiring a lot of testing, a lot of reporting, a lot of oversight for that. What do they get out of it? They get the protection that if you know, there's you know, a sample that exceeds our notification criteria, you don't have to notify because we're already regulating this. We know what's going on. Uh, we know that you know, on average in the big picture, the soil that's coming in is going to be meeting our, our, our goals, our requirements. If you happen to take one bad sample out of all of that, that doesn't uh, mess you up. But if you're at a fill project that did not enter into an ACO and somebody takes a sample and even if it's one bad sample, it just happens to pick that lead paint chip up uh, and they don't have the ACO, they don't have that notification liability protection. If they come up above our notification triggers, then they have to notify DEP. It comes into our waste site cleanup program, and that triggers a whole slew of requirements. So, so that's what the proponents get by entering into this ACO. It may seem onerous, but they get the uh, the comfort in knowing that they're abiding by the rules, and DEP is not going to come after them later, requiring them to clean up. So, in this graphic here. You have two projects, you have exactly the same thing. The COM15 project has a, an ACO, uh, the other one doesn't. So one has a permit, the other one doesn't have a permit. Uh, if soil is coming from a regulated 21E site, going to either project, that soil is going to be regulated. It's going to be tested. We're going to, people are going to know what's in it. The difference is both projects can take soil from, from anywhere. 
The COM15 project with the ACO, the soil coming from any location is going to be tested. It's, you're going to know what's in it. You're going to know whether or not it meets the acceptance criteria. The other site that does not have an ACO, that soil can come from anywhere. There's no requirement for testing. You don't know what's in it. Uh, so there's a benefit uh, from, to the proponent because they get some liability protection for entering into this ACO. And there's a huge benefit for, benefit for the community for people entering into the ACOs for, for, for doing this. If you're dealing with an uncontaminated site and a DPW is being prudent, if they're removing and moving a lot of soil around, what, what is a reasonable budget for testing soils? How much is the cost? How much should they set aside? Cost for testing soils, it's gonna depend on uh, what you're testing for, but the metals and pHs, the typical stuff, um, those tests are probably in the $150 yeah, example. $200 yeah. Joe, I can get you cost on that from the driving. Okay. It's basically, soil disposable. It's, it's, yeah. If it's a project not near the PCB Superfund, right. site, <laughs> but in the vicinity of what is it? What are PCBs? What's that? Cost? PCBs would, pro would probably be a couple hundred dollars. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. So it's not a big deal, and you're talking about one sample per hundred yards, or uh, not necessarily. Yeah. In circumstances like this, we would advise that you work closely with a licensed site professional mm -hmm. to develop a sampling plan that is appropriate for your property, the volume of soil, um, the different areas where the soil may have um, come from. All of those are circumstances that could drive wanting to take more samples or needing to take fewer. Yeah, you wouldn't bring in a licensed site professional on a project that you don't know is dirty because right. and then you're talking about $150 an hour from the LSP. Yeah. I mean, we're talking about just, we don't have any idea. You know, what's a what's a good sort of the, the initial volume to, yeah, the volume to, uh, to yeah. test ratio? Even, even for those circumstances, we generally recommend working with an environmental professional like a licensed site professional to give you some guidance with respect to what you should be sampling for and, and how much. Um, that's generally our guidance yeah. for these things. Even if you're not a 21E site, you're, you're not in the MCP, you don't have a requirement to engage in LSD. <clears throat> Whenever you're you know, sampling soil like this or you know, thinking about a redevelopment plan, our guidance is generally to work closely with an LSP. To, to get some advice with respect to that. But, it, but it, it's going to vary depending upon the project. You know, if it's a you yeah, know, yeah. hole in the ground that the DPW is, yeah. is dig, you know, they just, you're just gonna take one sample into it. But if it's, you know, if you're thinking about redo, you're rebuilding a school, building a yeah. new school, and you're doing, you're doing sampling, you, you're going to be excavating some material well, or you're bringing stuff in. about putting in a stormwater Basin rather than you know something where you do a phase one and yeah you know, yeah phase. things like that small defiant things you, know, you you grab a sample and, and the question might be whether you want to do discrete samples or you know, do a composite to to get your more of an average value but it it's kind of really the size and scope of the project uh, if you're if you're going to be spending $45 million building a school, then yeah, bring in a qualified environmental <laughs> professional early on. Uh, but if you're doing a, you know, you know $200,000 rain garden, <laughs> <laughs> then, you know, uh, it, it's going to vary. But you know, having, at least taking those initial samples, it's, it's better to take the samples uh, and know what you're dealing with uh, and you know, what's worse, well, in taking the samples initially, what's the worst that could go wrong? You take too many more than you really needed or you know, too few. But if you use your best judgment there, and then depending on what happens, you know, that might lead you to hiring a professional <laughs> afterwards, but. Uh, one, one of the questions that we always get, or that I always got was um, the two things when the neighbors get concerned about. One is sort of the concrete cement rubble um, used as fill. And the other one is the, the stumps, you know, stump dumps um, that we are, you know, get called. And, and people hear stump dumps and they, they get concerned. And, you know, nobody really knows too much about them or why they're, you know, other than, the, you know, compassion for, um, are those either, either of those really a concern in terms of, you know, site quality contamination? Uh, 
I don't think it they, BP has concrete as clean fill, right? That's if concrete is um, not painted, isn't contaminated with anything, um, the department has policies where under beneficial use, you can you know crush it six inch minus and use it for fill. Okay, six you, inch minus? Yeah, that's generally the, that's okay. generally the scope. Um, when you, you work, say that, is that like the reclaimed asphalt? Or is that ABC, concrete? asphalt brick concrete. Okay. Um, there are guidance with respect to how you can um, bury that type of material on a property as fill. Um, and you work through our solid waste division uh, to, if you need any beneficial use determination permits for that, they, they will help with that. In circumstances where it's completely clean and there's it's just concrete, um, you have wide latitude with what could be done with it, filling wet ones, but things like, um, and if it is painted um, or impacted with the, you know, a coating or something like that, then the solid waste program works with you and there are fewer options, but there are still options. Yeah, the, the risk of contamination or like the ABC material, you know, the paint might be lead paint, for instance, or, or tributyl tin or something like that. Or uh, if there's a coating on it, it might be mastic that might have asbestos in it. So there are, you know, for, for any material, there's a potential downside and that's why there are you know, rules about you know, again looking at it uh, identifying potential problems testing if necessary and find, finding out um, it's it's all kind of common hopefully common sense uh, but that might be part of people's concerns when they, they raise it how do you know that it's the clean material it's really that coating and that painting. Right? Yeah, painting coating. We've taken that. We've taken down um, mills in New Bedford where the bricks were actually weeping oil, weeping mm -hmm. solvents from uh, centuries of of factory work. There, um, obviously, those bricks and that material wasn't suitable for for grinding up and using a spill. Um, so you know, those are issues that questions that need to be need to be asked, and solid waste program runs a point on that. And there, you know, stump dumps. You know, in, in theory, stumps are yeah, you know, yeah. There might be compaction issues and all of that, and what happens when they eventually degrade uh, and, and slump. But uh, that's not a contamination issue. The issues there might be well, it's wood. Wood waste again isn't painted. You know, or is it being mixed with other things? Um, this would be the it, your contamination type of questions. So I think that's that's all I got. Uh, although, I, like I said, I could keep doing this for for hours. Uh, <laughs> there are a lot of ins and outs, but but in general, you know, the recommendation I would have would be to to ask about what uh, what's in it, ask for sampling. Um, and figure it out. There are uh, there are uses for the the, the in between soils uh, that have some measurable levels of stuff in it. So if you get a result, it it shouldn't be a, a yes or no. Is it is it clean or not? Is it non detect or not? It's you know, uh, there's guidance out there. We can certainly help uh, interpret the results that you get back. Is, is there some like uh, quantity um, limits or below which you don't care if somebody building a house and brings a truckload in, that sort of thing? Or is it? Uh, well, it depends on what your, <laughs> uh, in, in, in what program and what, um, but for, for this ACO stuff, uh, you know, we want to focus on the larger projects, like was the hundred thousand mm -hmm. cubic yards, cubic yards yeah. uh, or so, because we I mean, we don't have the resources to enter into an ACO with you know, a very small project. So we're really focusing on uh, the bigger projects here. Um, but from a you know, can it cause a problem point of view? Uh, yeah, there there isn't really a de minimis level, and from the waste I clean up side of the house. Uh, a sample that exceeds our notification requirements, we have reportable concentrations, 
that triggers notification and that triggers you know, at least further assessment and then maybe cleanup, depending on what the assessment shows. And there are very few de minimis levels there. Uh, there are, if you sample something and it comes up with uh, something above our reportable concentration and there's a 20 cubic yard, you know, if you can dig it up and get rid of it, it you know, dispose of it appropriately, not just get rid of it. Um, or a hazardous material and it's less than 20 cubic yards, then that can be done and notification doesn't have, have to happen. But it's those are really small quantity, quantities. And you really have to know what what's going on there. Those are mm -hmm. for obvious cases. If it's enough of a problem to that you're standing there saying, I've got this high result, I don't know where, where it's coming from, I don't know where it is, uh, I don't know how extensive this contamination is. Those are questions that should be asked and answered in a formal uh, waste site cleanup investigation with an LSP um, on the record as well. That whatever de minimis levels that are amounts of there are you know, 20 cubic yards for hazardous material, 100 cubic yards for petroleum contaminated material, and those are relatively small. There's the reason I ask is I know I can think of at least one place in town where the gentleman that's been filling for some time. I have no clue where it all comes from. And because with the town, as far as I know, we don't have any bylaws that you know, regulate anything like that. Yeah. So, uh, along those lines, no, I, I see some towns in, uh, around the Busby Washington with, with strong regs and in, in, in requirements for uh, bringing in and others with very little. Do you, do you, I don't know what the sense is around the state, but you have, can you point to some like model bylaws that yeah. uh, you know towns should consider? Uh, uh, yeah, there there aren't a lot, and I, I think they the very widely. Uh, so right now, I, I wouldn't point to any one particular one as as a model. I uh, more often than not. Uh, a lot of the bylaws are in reaction to to something. Yeah. Um, and I'm thinking Dartmouth down, down here, uh, where I, I believe it came out of one particular project in reaction to that. And and it's particularly with soil movement. It's I would recommend if somebody if you're pursuing it, you know, we would be certainly uh, willing to kind of chat about. What you should be concerned about and, and and options for for regulating it because it's very complicated and there's a lot of soil that's being moved around uh, and in various ways and in, and also in very small quantities and so you know the you know, I brought in soil from my backyard it was manufactured loam from a nearby farm you know there there are things that you might inadvertently. Uh, Make more complicated than needs to be with kind of a, a simple reactionary um, bylaw. So, in, in the town of Falmouth, I think it's a certain volume uh, that triggers it. What, what's the typical volume that some of the towns have adopted in terms of requiring a, a local permit? But, yeah, I, I would have to look into it. I, 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 I don't have. We have one that talks about removing soil, but nothing about bringing it in. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah and there are a lot of a lot of bylaws out there about removing soil. Uh, and, and sometimes I think the towns will add to that by having a parallel kind of filling law with that. A lot of towns have a soil board. Um, I know Dartmouth has a very strong soil board. I used to be working for them. They're pretty strong, but is that where the bylaws come from? Or well, I, I think they are, like I, said, I think Dartmouth is was in reaction to something, so they they uh, have very strong rules because of that. Uh, but I think most towns don't. Uh, so, it, I think it is much more common that uh, there's nothing on the books uh, about so like soil. The project up in Rochester. I mean, I've, there's been huge numbers of tractor trailer loads of fill going up there for that project, which is amazing. Mm. Not my town, yeah. <laughs> they go and, right by my house. And with with housing being what it is, for example, again, you know, I go back to my town, which is you know, Middlesex fills uh, uh, bedrock outcroppings a lot. So we see less fill and what well, we're, you know, the vacant lots we, we have left in our town 
are had previously been considered unbuildable because usually there's just massive amount of, of rock mm -hmm. there. And you know, it's amazing what a, a strong housing market will do to your your desire to to blast and flatten. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and in in but in other towns that instead of blasting uh, to create flat space to build, it, it may be filling. Uh, and so that you, know, you create buildable land, uh, however you can. And you know, a lot of time that's, when you have a, like a, a subdivision like that, that fill should be regulated by the planning board. Yeah, that's uh, so it's not my town. Yeah, but it's just. Yeah. Is that what Salmon is? Is it there? Yeah, I, 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 and it's not just on uh, subdivisions too. There's something on the book. I, and again, yeah, I, yeah in Bourne, it's a certain similar, number. And I think it, a lot of times it goes back to actual concerns about people quarrying and creating, uh, you know, cranberry bogs and things like that, where you know it's the excavation of the a certain amount of soil on a site that um, you know kind of triggers those. Um, and, and this fill near the coast too that. Is, is concerned in some Cape towns because people are just building up the right. land. Mm -hmm. um, get out of the flood zone. Get out of the flood zone. Yeah. 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 And that, I mean, that's going to be an, an, an issue. And it's one of the things that DEP is, is looking at. There is going to be demand for you know, raising elevations uh, for climate change mitigation. And in, in many cases, it's going to be appropriate to do that. There are obviously, again, speaking to say, con cops, there, there are a lot of places where we don't want that to happen. Uh, but there, there's going to be demand for, for soil or ABC material or other stuff to, to raise up. I mean, like Marion, I think the average elevation is like 16 feet or something yeah. like that. So, yeah. And that, that may certainly may be a good use for some of these soils. Uh, again, maybe not in the surficial level, where you know, kids would be playing in a backyard or, or in a park, but uh, but underneath uh, it may be a good place to uh, to use, reuse these materials and then use the uh, the cleaner soil, if you will, uh, on the surface. What about using this stuff under roads? Uh, that we've long pushed for for under roads or in rail beds are uh, as well. Uh, the 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 balance that has to be struck is, uh, and we hear from our friends at DOT. Uh, first, it, it has to meet the construction standards. Uh, you know, not all soil is the same, and you don't want soil with a lot of uh, organic material that's going to decompose and change its volume uh, underneath roads because then it will slump. Uh, so it has to meet the construction standards first and foremost. And um, with, particularly with large projects, uh, I often find that uh, people, meeting the transportation folks, are willing to pay uh, a bit more of a premium to get just consistent, reliable quality from one location rather than seeking to reuse, reuse material. Uh, for other purposes. So it, it, it depends on the nature of the project, so the amount of material they need, the timing of it, because it's all about timing. Whether you're excavating material for a construction project or you're bringing material in for a construction project, uh, time is worth more than, um, than any other consideration. That you, you need to know that that soil either is leaving when it, you said it was going to leave or coming in when you said it was going to come in. And anything that introduces uncertainty in that equation is is bad for the project. More questions? I can talk about this all day too. Yeah. Isn't <laughs> it fun? <laughs> Thank you very much. Do, do you want to add anything? Yeah. Coming in, yeah, I apologize for for being late. Um, we do not have any pending requests uh, for soil rec projects um, in the region right now. Have you guys heard buzz that there one is coming or? No, it, it, most, most of the stuff that I saw in my experience was sort of the smaller, you know, you don't exactly know where it came from. You know, you start to see, you know, you see the fill, but you also see a pipe sticking out of it. And you see, uh, you know, but that, you know, I think, you know, a lot of the, the big projects, especially in these older towns, have typically been. Um, but uh, certainly landfill reuse and um, and wastewater reuse is where you know it's going to be in the future. It's 
especially with the PFAS and some of that, some of that information. Um, that's going to be, I think, moving forward. The the big issues is how you how you get rid of that stuff in the portal. How do you reuse that materials? Yes, you can talk about that all day. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there are some issues with you know some constructed cranberry bogs yeah. being filled in now yeah. and being turned into subdivision yeah. and, yeah. Or, or solar fields or whatever. <laughs> So like I said before, I offered up the Southeast Regional Office and John and Millie um, and, and everybody else there. Yep, absolutely. Uh, if any questions, um, reach out to Lakeville and we are at your disposal. Whether it's soil rack, soil waste, whatever it may be. Well, no other questions, well, I'd like to thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was very educational. It's not something I really thought about in the past. Mark brought it up to me. Mark, you're there, huh? Mark has found me. Anybody online? Any questions? Go ahead, Mark. No, I, I just had a question about. Um, you know, when when these areas are being, I mean, when you talk about the areas, uh, you know, old gravel pits being filled in, um, you know, you're talking about the final, the final procedure, right? Because one of the things I, I notice around, um, at least in some of our gravel pits, you know, they remove, you know, you know, the tons of material, the sand, which is you know, what they're mainly looking for. But then they use it as like storage areas for uh, concrete for rubble for and uh, and just some of the stuff I've seen where you know the the pit was excavated and the next thing you know it oh they're filling it in it looks like they're covering stuff up and then there's more stuff that's coming in like to set up as for uh, processing or so I don't know it's just sort of bizarre I mean do you I know you're typically talking about just you know when you're uh, when you're completely done there. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, during the course of the activities of an active gravel pit, and I guess that's probably based on you know town bylaws or zoning or planning. You know, so are they able to just sort of you know fill in areas? You know, and just sort of leave them there for a while before they come for the final cap off. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I think we do see a lot of gravel pits that are either at the end of their working life, they, they also use it as staging area for like CND material and, and that sort of thing. And, and that, that use is probably more regulated by the local community as an ongoing business. Or uh, the fact that it's located in a gravel pit, you know, it could have been located on an old farm or something. It's the same sort of thing. Uh, and the the filling of it, bringing material in 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 leaving it again. If they do it under an ACO with us, then uh, we know it's going in there, and they they have some liability protection. Or uh, if if they don't do it that way, and they're just bringing in material and kind of filling it up, placing it and forgetting about it, then at, at some point, you know, they may, uh, there may be contamination that will have to be assessed and cleaned up. Uh, and then the question is, how do we find out about it? You know, how does that come into the system? And where are those responsible parties at that point in time? <laughs> uh, and, you know, we, have, uh, we have far too many examples of, you know, and, this is not a modern your know, problem. Yeah, you know, we talked about uh, Sullivan's Ledge. Uh, there are a lot of sites that we're we're working on that have been gravel pits, and then you know people poured waste oil there, or people dumped. Um, you know, I can can imagine people dumping old boilers and stuff that you you end up find out had you know asbestos are uh, in it. Uh, you know, empty spaces, particularly holes in the ground that are isolated. There's not a lot of oversight 
you know, not a clear view what's going on in there, you know, it, whether it's a, a gravel pit or just an isolated rural area that meets those descriptions. Those are the places where we find um, you know, midnight dumping or um, you know, things that eventually turn into bigger problems. You know, luckily, we don't, we don't see the classic fields of abandoned drums that we used to. <laughs> uh, you know, we've, we've moved a long way in this and, and people are more aware and the neighbors are more aware and we tend to find these things sooner than we did before. But, you know, if they continue, continue to happen. Um, so this, again, I, I think we, the good piece about all of this soil stuff that we're trying to do is to try to find uh, an affordable, legal, safe, appropriate way to get, to, to reuse these materials, almost to get rid of these materials, to reuse these, these materials uh, so that you, you have, there's less of an incentive for people to, to dump it and run the risk of, of contaminating places. But if it becomes difficult and expensive, then that's when you start seeing more of the dumping. So. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Oh, thanks so, for having us. We have, we have to move along. Yes. <laughs> 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 <laughs>